Good uh, day, everyone. How's it going? Hope everything's good with you. Um, a warm welcome. We're going to talk uh, quickly about Papias. He was one of the early, early apostolic fathers. Um, comes before a few of the people we've talked about already. Um, at about a, around about 100 to 140, he was writing his works. Um, then we're going to have a, a butchers of what is said about him by other church fathers because we only have information from other fathers uh, about him. He is an important component of the early church and it's all very interesting. So I'm just going to continue to quote from the book I'm writing. Uh, this isn't a particularly long chapter, so buckle in, enjoy, and here we go. Writing most likely a uh, hundred years after Jesus died, Papias enters the scene writing an account too late for any legitimate claim on historicity, but he is a noteworthy character for Christians and is a source outside the official Christian literature. An early apostolic father coming too late to have communicated with any eyewitnesses to uh, New Testament events, he was a most active um, any time between 100 and up to as late as 150, but it's impossible to give accurate dates uh, when, as he makes uh, some, and he makes some rather ridiculous claims uh, to boot. He uh, purports to be a disciple of John the Elder, also John the Presbyter, uh, sometimes confused with John the uh, Evangelist, but this is probably untrue, and Eusebius unequivocally distinguishes the John mentioned by Papias from John the Evangelist regardless. He is generally reputed to have known a few eyewitnesses, two eyewitnesses nonetheless, so let's take a look. There is scant uh, fragmentary legacy uh, of his work. We shall not quote him much, but his writings and conjecture about him can easily be found online. Interestingly, Papias didn't care for books and put his trust instead in hearsay, as he considered books to be unreliable sources. Uh, quote, for I did not think uh, that information from the books was profit uh, to uh, me as much, sorry, would profit me uh, as much as information from a living and a surviving voice. This is quoted uh, by Eusebius in Ecclesiastical Histories. Uh, given the state of early Christian literature, literature, one may be inclined to agree with him, a man of very little intelligence, according to Eusebius, in the same character uh, chapter sorry, quoted above. He came from what is today modern Turkey, a place in ancient Phrygia called Hierapolis. He was a disciple of the martyr, uh, martyr Polycarp, and though he claimed not to have known any uh, of the original disciples, his surviving work, um, an important tomb in uh, the Christian world, is known as the Expositions of the uh, Oracles of the Lord, uh, five volumes in all, though it only survives in a few Christian fathers' fragmentary quotations and commentary, including Irenaeus and Eusebius. So they're the guys who quote him um, the most, and we don't have many quotes, unfortunately, from him. And it's a big tome, like five volumes, and no one sought to really preserve it. And these two guys, um, Eusebius and Irenaeus, could easily have preserved this work, we can assume, and, and talked about it more if it had more of a weighty um, evidence for the historical Jesus in it. We don't have it. Why not? What was in it? I wonder. Um, that Papias was not himself a hearer and eyewitness of sacred apostles. So again, he, he, he's third or fourth um, removed from the historical Jesus. Instead, uh, saying he learned what he could from those who knew him. Uh, but Papias himself, again quote, but Papias himself in the preface of his discourses uh, by no means declares that he was himself a hearer and eyewitness of the holy apostles, but he shows by the words which he uses that he received the, do uh, the doctrines of the faith from those who were their friends. So book, book three again, same chapter. Um, this is therefore third, possibly even fourth, hand information regarding Jesus' life. Can we trust him? Does what he uh, we have in quotes from him afford us an interpretation on minimal mythicism as well? It, it actually might. 
his work, exposition, exposition sorry, the oracles of the Lord, uh, might just give it away. This is partially speculative on my part, on the author's part, but oracle, according to the standard Oxford definition, uh, means a priest or priestess acting as a medium through who, uh, whom advice or prophecy was sought from the gods in classical antiquity. So, anyway, yeah, with the, uh, well, this sounds like something Paul might have be, uh, been doing through his many revelations. An oracle is someone who interprets dreams, visions, and other signs from other worlds. Oh, sorry, are these historical witnesses to the earthly Jesus? We cannot tell. This may go some way to helping us understand why Eusebius would then say, the same writer gives also other accounts which he says came to, to him through unwritten tradition, certain strange parables and teachings of the Savior and some other more mythical things. So what is he driving at here? Some other more mythical things. Is this um, is it that he is talking about the accounts he just mentioned coming through unwritten tradition being mythical? Two or some other accounts on top. The author is not fluent, unfortunately, in uh, ancient Greek, but it's it'd be great to find out. Here again in chapter 39, Eusebius states, to these uh, belong his statements that there will be a, a period of some thousand years after the resurrection of the dead, and that a kingdom of Christ will be set up in material form on this very earth. I suppose he got these ideas uh, through a misunderstanding of the apostolic accounts, not perceiving that the, the, that the things said to him were spoken mystically in figures. And again, I think Paul um, states that our resurrection bodies won't necessarily be from this world. I think he actually quite clearly states that. So already um, the, the funny thing is a lot of Christians think like Papias here and we will be bodily resurrected. It's not what Paul says, it's what the Gospels I think say. But we can already see that Papias might be reading from a slightly different song sheet. We may proffer that he's or infer that he, he might be talking about a more Gnostic uh, way to interpret things. He can't help us much when, again, Eusebius evidently isn't much uh, happy with Papias' sources, not his interpretation of them, nor, sorry, his interpretation of them. If he were indeed a receiver inform of information from a mere three degrees of separation from the Lord himself, is it not more reasonable to assume he does know what he's talking about? Why this doubt for Eusebius? What was Papias saying? Again, quote again. But concerning Matthew, he writes as follows. So then Matthew wrote the oracles in the Hebrew language, and everyone interpreted them as he was able. Again, this only one. Continue. Interpreted as they were able is not exactly a way you'd relay historical details about an earthly messiah. However, it is language you'd use in relation to oracles, channeling material from revelations about the Lord. It's illustrative that we find nothing else Eusebius thought to convey about Jesus in Papias' work. Why not? Why did he evidently reject so much? What was in those five volumes? A weighty tomb, tome, we may assume. Um, and the same writer uses testimonies from the first epistle of John and from that of Peter likewise. But the church father recounts Papias' works, uh, can't bring himself to tell us what they were, recounting, sorry. Um, clearly, he had these volumes in front of him, and he relates others, another story of a woman who was accused of many sins uh, before the Lord, which is contained in the gospel according to the Hebrews. And Hebrews is much more celestial in origin. More in Hebrews, um, yes, yeah, sorry, it is a celestial Jesus mentioned in Hebrews. He gives reference again, um, I'm not, sorry, I'm not quoting it, again reference to uh, also to grapes coming in profusion. Many, many grapes. That, uh, through Arrhenius we read, the days will come in which vines shall grow, and having 10,000 branches, and each branch 10,000 twigs, and each twig a true twig, 10,000 shoots, in, and in every one of the shoots, 10,000 clusters. 
and on every one of their clusters 10,000 grapes, and every grape will, uh, when pressed will give 5 and 20 meters of wine. And when any one of the saints shall lay hold of a, cust of, a, of a cluster, sorry, another shall cry out, I am a better cluster, take me, <laughs> bless the Lord through me. And this is in against heresies. This doesn't help us much with, his, with Jesus' historicity. Suffice it to say, he probably had a thing for grapes and perhaps a penchant for wine. Um, talking grapes, right? This is clustered, you know, take me instead, I'm better than that cluster. Going back to Eusebius, he tells us an ancient man um, who was a hero of John and a companion of Polycarp. Yes, again, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself here. This, however, most probably is not the case. He cannot have known John the Apostle personally as he arrives too late and there is uh, still a debate over which John he was referring to, as mentioned. His contributions to early Christianity are marred, mirrored, mirrored by comments such as Eusebius. He didn't exactly value him as entirely credible himself, stating glibly, he appears to have been a very of li limited understanding, um, as one can see from his discourses, Ecclesi ecclesiastical histories again. Though Eusebius, uh, through Eusebius, sorry, a man himself prone to literary invention, we see Papias as a peculiar and certainly not too, all too rigorous approach um, to gathering his historical data. Um, Rather than getting close to the facts at hand, he is known to have relied on hearsay, and it is a sad truth that the rumour mill surrounding early Christianity was set to full speed. As we have already articulated, very little, actually nothing, even remotely substantial, comes to us until the 50s and 60s, and this is, a, and this is highly reliant on the dating of Paul's epistles being correct. Correct, as it is Paul, basically, um, who is one of the earliest sources. And we know Paul tells us practically nothing, often relaying information regarding a celestial and etheric Jesus. That is Paul's Jesus, basically. So in Papias, we find a man who uh, kicked out literary information and relied solely on stories people would tell him. Perhaps he required hearsay, as at the time, um, there was practically nothing written down to go from. This is probably reasonable to assume. But hearsay from whom? Can, uh, could we have been? Could he have been relying on information from any happy traveller he met, eager to tell him anything he wanted to hear? Who knows? Uh, David Fitzgerald, recounting one of the stranger and outlandish things uh, found in Papias, writes. Uh, 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 obviously, someone like Papias is the last person we would ever want to rely upon for information. Unfortunately, except uh, for the equ equally problematic Book of Acts, uh, Papias is the earliest historian, for lack of a better word, of early Christianity we have, despite writing over a century after the fledgling religion began. Unsurprisingly, the reports he has to offer us are just as ridiculous as we might expect from such a uh, reliable source. Take the horror story about Judas ballooning up full of pus and worms until his loathsome bloated head and festering body were, in, uh, were, were the width of a wagon. This is what Papias says, lingering in agony until finally dying at home, um, not by hanging or having his guts spontaneously burst um, open per, as per Matthew and Luke, Matthew 27, 5 and Acts 1, 18. By the time Papias was an old man, a Christian legends and fabricated sayings of the Lord had clearly multiplied like bunnies, and he believed whatever story he ran across. This gives us a snapshot of, of what Christians all knew about Jesus by the mid-2nd century and the state of their ongoing fabrications about him. That's quite self-explanatory. It's sad in, in, in many ways that this is what we have to go on. Yes, the festering, this festering blood, um, pus-filled mess of a balloon, the treacherous 
uh, Judas is reduced to come straight from Papias. This example above um, Fitzgerald brings up in direct contravention with biblical accounts, he was hanged in, in Matthew uh, 27, 5, is obviously fictional. It does resemble Acts' version of Judas' death a little more, but involve, uh, involving guts spilling out, uh, but Papias uses some gross embellishments. Um, whoever relayed this to Papias clearly wanted to grossly, quite literally, exaggerate the grim nature of uh, Judas' death in a frankly morbid and comic style uh, of divine punishment for having been so disloyal to the Lord and his beloved son. He is notable for giving accounts of Matthew also, though we, as we have it today, it is brief. Uh, quote again, Therefore Matthew put the logia in an ordered arrangement in the Hebrew language, but each person interpreted them as best he could. Logia is commonly interpreted as sayings today, but this is problematic as it is. It become, uh, it's become an item of modern literary scholarship to view the Gospels as Greco-Roman in origin. Um, you know, I'm going to go into this later in other videos. Indeed, we have no earthly copies of surviving fragments in Hebrew, and they contain too many tropes and stylistic quirks and reference to... Uh, so in reference to Greco-Roman literature, what's worse for Papias' reliability is this con in this context is that Matthew relies heavily on Mark in writing his gospel. Whoever Matthew may have been, it's probably um, pseudonymous. Um, with almost all of Mark's gospel, 661 verses found in Matthew, 607, and much of it quoted verbatim. It looks like now, um, it looks likely now that the names Mark, Matthew, and Luke may well have been ascribed to the Gospels um, decades after their writing. Both Mark and Luke were the two most common names in that area of the world, with Matthew not far behind. We should remember that uh, we should remind the reader also that no contemporary or near contemporary evidence outside the Bible exists corroborating even the existence of these men, um, apart from stuff like this. Um, and there's not, yeah, there's really not much there. This doesn't seem unlikely seeing Papias' criterion for gauging historical fact, i.e. what people on their travels tell him. Uh, we do uh, wish to be fair, however, and remember this guy came from Turkey. Uh, we do uh, wish um, to be fair, however, and Bart Ehrman does make a few important points and has shown the relative value of what we find in Papias' writings. He writes, Many conservative Christian scholars use this statement to prove that what Papias says is historically accurate, especially about Mark and Matthew, but that is going beyond what the evidence gives us. Still, on one point, there can be no doubt. Papias may pass on some legendary traditions about Jesus, but he is quite specific, and there is no reason to think he is telling a bald-faced lie. Uh, that he knows people who knew the apostles or the apostles' companions, this is not eyewitness testimony of the life of Jesus, but it is getting very close to that. Uh, where conservative scholars go astray is in thinking that Papias gives us reliable information about the origins of our Gospels of Matthew and Mark. And here at least we do find some evidence, though not eyewitness um, of someone who says they met people who met the apostles. It is a somewhat tortured connection to Jesus of Nazareth, so it can and so can, it can be truly uh, sorry, uh, be, so can it truly be seen as reliable and give us any real quantitative evidence? Christian scholars are oft inclined to give support to Papias' surviving words when it fits their views and reject much of his work, uh, other works, sorry, and sayings, when they are clearly making no sense. 
it is possible that there were informed Christ uh, people sorry, who met key figures that made it into the Bible. And we know the Bible mentions some historical people. John the Baptist is one such example. But we do not have evidence and indeed have clear evidence against much of the New Testament narratives. It also, it's also worthy of uh, note that apostles... Uh, comes up a lot when Papias is mentioned. Apostles not necessarily being disciples, as we have seen from Paul's use of the word. And what vague references we have of Papias never gives us anything concrete regarding the earthly Jesus, um, what the earthly Jesus ever did. For as we know, for all we know, uh, sorry, he may be construing Jesus in exactly the way we so often see Paul's construing Jesus, Paul construing Jesus in heavenly terms and only perceivable in, sorry, revelation. We have seen uh, how key words and ideas could have been misinterpreted by Papias, admitted by Eusebius as mystical and that even then Eusebius could have potentially rejected information of a divine and ethereal Jesus who came in vision, and indeed Papias using oracles in the title of his work isn't a good sign either. So is Papias a truly reliable witness to Jesus' historicity? We think not. Bart Ehrman summarizes uh, matters perfectly when he writes, uh, we're almost coming to the end now, if scholars are inclined to discount what Papias says in virtually every other instance, why is it that they sometimes appeal to his witness in order to show that we have an early tradition that links Matthew to one of our Gospels and Mark to another? Why do these scholars accept some of what Papias said, but not all of what he said? I suspect it is because they want to have support for their own points of view. Matthew really wrote Matthew and have decided to trust Papias when he confirms their views and not trust him when he does not. The result uh, of this quick examination of Papias is, I'm still quoting him, I'm sorry, I think that he, he passes on stories that he has heard and he attributes them to people who knew other people who said so. But when he can be checked, he appears to be wrong. Can he be trusted in the place, uh, places that he cannot be checked? If we have a friend who is consistently wrong when he gives directions to places you are familiar with, do you trust him when he gives directions for some place you've never been? This is Jesus interrupted. Um, so, yeah, what do we have? Unfortunately... A uh, guy who is not not really particularly trusted by his own um, Christian brothers uh, coming later on. Uh, sorry about the noise outside. Someone's cutting some grass. Uh, I'm going to leave that there. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you stayed to the end as well. I know that these can be quite long. Um, take care, guys. This is, again, one of the reasons I'm doing this are to just establish what we have in the Christian record for Jesus Christ. And, and uh, it's not much, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I'm going to get on to more of the reasons so many people are now seeing Jesus as much more of a force that never really existed in human form, that, that um, exists inside you dominantly. And when you switch it on, you can achieve gnosis. So. Anyway, take care. I'm going to be back tomorrow. Have a good one, guys. Uh, nice one. Bye-bye.